so glad you're here today and uh, got to see those baptisms. Uh, I don't know about the whole Jersey thing, but uh, that was kind of funny anyway. But uh, hey, uh, if, you're, if you're new with us, we're walking through the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 15 today, verses 22 through 41. Today we're talking about church problems 2.0, biblical unity. And I know you've probably never been at a church where there's problems or struggles or anything like that, but the early church had them. And so we're going we're gonna to look at that and how they dealt with those and going on. So as we think about the unity, here's something I, I, I want to ask. What is the hardest thing in the world for you to agree on with people? Or, or you know, what, what, what's out there? I mean, I, I think for my, my wife and I, a lot of times it's uh, where we're going to eat. You guys ever have that? You know, not sure. Uh, and then someone names something, you're like, no, nah, I don't like that. I don't care where we eat, but I don't like that, right? Uh, or or maybe, it, uh, maybe you sit down, you guys just find a long day, and you have a little bit of time to sit before the TV, and it's like, what are we going to watch? Well, I don't know. Let's, let's flip through every 4.3 billion options there are before we figure it out, right? You ever do that? But a lot of times, there's not unity on those. Those are minor things, but uh, what about bigger things? What about things in the United States? Uh, see, we, we call ourselves the United States, but I would say we're more like the divided states, right? I, I mean, in so many different issues, in so many different ways, uh, our, our country is not what it has been, and, and it continues to go down a divided path, which is really sad. Uh, well, you think about the, the country, then let's go talk about the church. And the church is divided and fractured in so many ways from different uh, uh, things of disunity that have taken place. Uh, I, I want to make sure we understand we're called to biblical unity rather than church division. Uh, church division and denominations was not God's idea. That's been, uh, been Satan's attack and man's selfishness that has caused that to happen in most cases. And we'll talk about a case where that's not the case, but uh, I was doing some research on this and I don't know. Uh, I, about 15 years ago was one of these uh, board meetings back when we, we were lined up a little different back then. We had a board meeting where uh, we had division over something that was really, really, it was impactful for the people's salvation who were coming. We spent over an hour talking about were we going to go with electric drums or acoustic drums, <laughs> Right? And it's funny now, 15 years later, things have changed a lot in, in, in leadership since then, but uh, uh, you can see what won. But, um, uh, you know, there's, there's all these churches that are uh, divide and, and are disunified because of certain things. I was reading Tom Rayner, who's a, a church expert. He put out this list on churches that didn't have unity, and here's some of the things they were fighting over. A fight over whether or not to build a children's playground or to use the land for a cemetery. <laughs> right? Full of life or full of death? One of the two. You, you pick. Uh, there was a dispute in the church because the Lord's Supper had cran grape juice instead of grape juice. Oh my goodness. What are we going to do, right? Uh, they, they really just need to go back to wine if they want to be really biblical. A lot of you are like, yeah. <laughs> Number three, two different churches reported fights over the type of coffee. In one of the churches, they moved from Folgers to a stronger Starbucks brand. In the other church, they simply moved to a stronger blend. Members left the churches because of coffee. Folks, let me tell you something. We provide coffee. We know it's not the greatest coffee out there. Okay, just so you know that. But we're not changing it in order to keep you here, right? If you come because of the coffee, you really got to get a life. Right? And, and some, some people are still upset that we don't have donuts and we have cookies instead of donuts like we used to have. Uh, don't worry, come back on Easter and we'll have donuts for you. Easter and Thanksgiving, those two times we have donuts, right? But, but there's so many silly things that people argue over. There's one, and this one, you know, I don't know what you think it is. There's an argument on whether the church should allow deviled eggs at the church meal. <laughs> Watch out, never know what those are going to do. Well, today we're talking about biblical unity in the midst of all the disunity that's out there. And last week we talked about the fact that salvation is saved by grace through faith alone. It's through Jesus. It's not through anything we do. It's not through the church. It's not through giving to God. It's not through being in church attendance. It's all through Jesus. And, and that's this message that we talk every single week. It's the gospel message, the good news, that we need to be saved from something. And what do we need to be saved from? We need to be saved from ourselves. And we need to be saved from the sin that we have done against God and his people and even to our own 
bodies. And, and the Bible says that in order to be in relationship with God, that sin has to be paid for. But it also says the only way sin can be paid for is through death. And so what we deserve is to go to a place called hell where we're away from God and in eternal punishment. That's death. That's a, uh, the forever death, the eternal death that we deserve. And so the debt would be paid there, right? But God loved you enough and he loved me enough. We know that from John 3, 16, for God so loved, right, that he gave Jesus. And God said, I want to be with you, so I want to provide a way for you to be with me through the death of Jesus. That's why we celebrate that. And this week, we're really, this is our, our, our Super Bowl week, right? I mean, it's, this is, we celebrate the resurrection every week, but uh, I mean, come Easter week, it's like Christians get a little extra pumped because it's like, woo, it's our week and we get excited and we do that. But it's all because Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection pays for our sins for all those who call upon him as Lord and Savior. It's that easy. And we're forgiven. If you've never done that, we'd love to talk to you about what it means to follow Jesus. And we'd love for you to text the word follow to the number on the screen. And some will talk to you. We'll have elders and pastors down front. We'd love to talk to you about this amazing decision. It is the gospel. It's why we exist. It's what the church is for. The church isn't here for our comfort. The church isn't here so that we can have some place to go on Sunday mornings. The church is here that we might proclaim the gospel and grow up disciples following after Jesus. So today we're going to be looking at biblical unity. And as we jump in, to Acts 15. We're going to look at 22 through 31 to start. They had that Jerusalem council last week where these Judaizers were trying to get everybody circumcised in order to be a Christian. And, and they said, no, you don't have to be circumcised to be a Christian, right? You just need to have Jesus. I encourage you to go look back at that message if, if you weren't here. Uh, but in verse 22, it says, then the apostles and the elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas called Barsabbas. I want to make sure you understand that's not Judas Iscariot. He is dead. He, he betrayed Jesus, right? Uh, and this is a different Judas. And Silas, men who were leaders among the believers, with them they sent the following letter, the apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends, Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth that we, what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with any beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. So the council takes place. All you need is Jesus, not Jesus plus circumcision or Jesus plus uh, anything, right? If you remember from last week, we said Jesus plus nothing equals everything, right? There, there's nothing. Jesus is it. He is everything. And, and we need to be united about that. Biblical unity is about Jesus. And, and that's what's going on here. Here comes this letter and here comes this, hey, uh, these guys are coming down there to show you that we mean this. This is what we, we're saying. It's Jesus alone. You don't need anything else. Hey, but it's probably good that you do these four things, but uh, it's all about Jesus. Uh, Paul continues to speak to that in Philippians chapter two. And he says this, he says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being what? united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And then he goes on a few more verses and talks about Jesus's mindset. Uh, Paul says we have to understand that we need to be united in Christ. When we're united in Christ, it means he's the head. We're underneath that, right? We don't get to be in charge. We don't get to dictate anything. We are united in him. Being a Christian, you're taking on his name, saying I'm living for him. We're called to be like-minded, have the same love, be one in spirit. We're called to value others above ourselves. We're called to be like Jesus. Uh, unity is under the headship and the lordship of Jesus. Disunity is under the headship or lordship of Satan. Uh, when we become disunified and we make that our, 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 uh, our point of view that we want to just say, hey, it's all about me and not what Jesus says, then we come under the head of Satan. This unity division is a sin and it's not of Christ. 
right? Jesus said something in Matthew 16. He said, uh, see if anybody gets this. This is 10, point, 10 bonus points for you if you get this. Jesus, when he's talking about the church, he says, I will what, my church? Starts with B, ends with ild. Anybody know it? I will. The rest of you are a little slow over here, right? A little slow on the take. B-U-I-L-D. I will build my church. I will not destroy it. He doesn't say I will fracture my church. He doesn't say uh, I will disunify my church. He says I will build my church. Uh, the nominations, as we said earlier, were not God's plan for the church. Now, there have been a few good divisions that have taken place because it, it lines up under biblical unity of Christ, right? There's, uh, the, the biggest one that's taken place, the biggest split in the church that has taken place uh, dates back to the 1500s. And in uh, 1517, uh, you, you might have heard of this thing that was called the 95 Thesis that a guy by the name of Martin Luther put on the Wittenberg Door uh, Church uh, and, and it was basically 95 things that he was, a, he was a Catholic monk. And as he continued to study the Word of God, Martin Luther came to realize that there were some things within the Catholic Church. Now, Catholic is, is, a, is the word, it means universal. So there were some things that came uh, out in the universal church that he said, man, this isn't right. This doesn't match up with Bible. And so when he put that on the door, he wasn't trying to start this, this protest, which is where we get Protestant from, right? He wasn't trying to start that. He was trying to say, let's talk about these issues. And, and he was basically coming to the church and saying, things that you have set up about church authority and the and the papacy and all the things here don't line up with scripture. It was all about uh, the sole source of spiritual authority should be the Bible and not what man thinks or, or the Pope. And he came up with all these things that, uh, to walk through. Well, the church didn't like to hear that. They didn't like to hear that they, they may be wrong on something. And they uh, called him a heretic. And there's all sorts of things that happened in that. I, I'd encourage you, if you ever want to go see more about this story, uh, this is where the, the Reformation, uh, there's a lot of it that began right there with Martin Luther. And then you also had John Calvin and Erwin uh, Zwingli in Switzerland, some different guys that helped with the Reformation. Uh, but there's a, there's a 2003 movie called Luther that I would encourage you to, uh, to watch so you can understand a little bit more. Because this was a good split because it was based upon biblical unity. It was based upon the Bible as the authority and not the church. Right? So, so biblical unity is about Jesus and about the, uh, the word. Right? We have to understand that. Can I tell you something? Just because a church has the word unity or united in front of it doesn't mean that it's uh, biblically united with God. The Unity Church, if, uh, maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. Uh, uh, the Unity Church, it's world headquarters in Kansas City, but uh, the Unity Church, if you ever go look at their beliefs, and, and, and remember, don't always just take what I say. Make sure you search this stuff out to make sure what I'm saying is true. Uh, but the Unity Church basically believes you can believe whatever you want and we'll all get to where we're going. And they have five main principles. I'm just going to read a couple of these principles and see if you can see if they match up with Scripture or they're against Scripture. One of them is God is everywhere and always present in every circumstance. This divine energy underlies and animates all of existence. Weird. Human beings are innately good because they are connected to an expression of spirit. That's uh, not what the Bible says. It says we're evil and we've got this sinful nature. And this one, this one really, I mean, just takes you farther out into left field. I mean, you're out in the street by here, but... Our thoughts have creative power to influence events and determine our experiences. And you feel like you just got into some sort of drug-induced coma right there, right? I, I mean, it, our thoughts have creative power to influence. I mean, this is bewitched in, in, a, in a religion. It, it's, it's so not biblical, right? Jesus said uh, there's, a, there's a narrow road. Right? And many don't find it. There's other churches that put United in front of their names, and, and you see it, and you're like, oh, they're United. That's great. But that United in front of a church name doesn't necessarily mean United. Matter of fact, the reason there was a United is because they were divided, and they wanted to separate themselves, and so they say they were United. Right? That goes a different thing. Now, uh, just to be fair and to offend all church denominations, uh, just because uh, a church doesn't have United doesn't mean that they are United. Follow that, Right? I mean, you're like, I lost you five minutes ago. I don't know. <laughs> Biblical unity centers around the teachings and truths of Jesus. And that's what the Jerusalem Council was pushing for, and that's what we want to push for. So we jump back in to verse 32 through 35. It says, Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After spending some time there, they were sent off by the believers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. 
But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. So it says these guys came and they were going back. Uh, Some of your Bibles, if you look at your Bibles, there's actually going to be a little mark on verse 34. And there's nothing written in 34. It's a little letter or a little note that will tell you some manuscripts include here, but Silas decided to remain there. Just want to make sure you understand what, what's going on there in your Bible if you ever see something like that. Because there's several verses in the New Testament where that's the case. Um, and, and so here's what happens. Uh, the, when they put the New Testament together, there were over 25,000 manuscripts that were used to document the validity of the New Testament. That's uh, like six times more than any other uh, document that we have or any other book that, that's out there. And in this, there's some manuscripts that were a little later on, and, and somebody, they, they believe, just added to one of the manuscripts later on, but Silas stayed there, right? It's not a theological point. It's not nothing to do with understanding theology. He, this person that was translating it wanted to make sure people knew that Silas stayed there because here in just a few minutes, he's going to be going off with Saul or Paul. And, and so as we, we look at that, uh, don't, don't ever get freaked out by that. That's just going off manuscripts, and there's nothing theologically uh, in that sentence that was added or taken out, depending on which way you look at it. It says, they preached, they encouraged, they strengthened, right? Uh, different teachers were walking in step with, with the Spirit, and I think it was given us an example that a biblical unity is achievable. God didn't give us an uh, unachievable task, right? He, he, he wanted to make sure that we understood that there is a way for that to happen. Now, a lot of churches and a lot of theology would have had to change uh, for us to reach this today, but it is achievable. Uh, And biblical unity in our church, we want that to be there, but I I think you have to understand something about biblical unity. Uh, Biblical unity doesn't mean I I agree with everything that Jeff agrees with, I agree with everything you agree with. Biblical unity doesn't mean that you have to agree on every single thing that deals with theology. I'll be honest with you. I I have a different end times view than many elders and pastors and many of you. I have a different end times view than you. We don't have to agree on that. You can choose to be wrong if you want to. We, you know, it's just one of those things that uh, uh, it doesn't matter, right? But when it comes to salvation, your end times view, my end times view, it, it, it's not the, the essential stuff. You know, what, how, we, how we do communion, how many times or what we do, do we pass, do we grab, do we share in one? That's stuff we need to do as far as communion. We're called to do that, and we do that every week. But how that's done is not an essential matter. And so biblical unity is achievable. It doesn't always mean uh, that you agree with everything. Uh, can, I, can I ask you this question if we're going to be honest here today? We try to be honest every Sunday, but uh, how many of you don't agree with some of the things that God did in the Bible. Some of you are like, man, lightning's going to come down or my chair's going to get electrified or something if I raise my hand. My hand was up. You know, there's, I, I read through some of the stuff, and in the Old Testament, and there's some things that happen uh, with, with people, and I'm like, oh, man, I sure wouldn't have done that if I was God, right? Lucky for you, I'm not, just so you understand. And, and that's okay, God's bigger than that. You know what? You know who's right in that scenario? Not me. It's okay. I don't have to. Agree. I love what Pastor Tim Keller said when he said this: "If your God never disagrees with you, you might be worshiping an idealized version of yourself." Ooh, ouch! Right? It doesn't matter if you agree with God or not. God is right. You have the freedom to not agree. Now, it can't come to uh, essential stuff. You know, you can't disagree with God about how to be saved. Right? You can maybe disagree with how things happen in history and what he and you can disagree with some different things that aren't essential, but you can't disagree with God and think you're okay if it comes to the essential things we're talking about. But biblical unity is achievable, but it doesn't mean agreement and everything. It means essentials when it comes to things like salvation and the authority of the Word of God. We we always talk about our number one value is is the Bible is final authority. We believe that. We want to live that. Right? Paul talks about unity throughout his letters as he writes them to the churches and He's writing to uh, the church in Ephesus, and, and he, he says this in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach what? 
unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And Paul says, unity brings about maturity. Right? And, and all of us are called to do our part. Uh, we're, we're called to be faithful to that. Everybody has a part. In our body, we're, uh, we're held together uh, through the head of Jesus. He's in charge. And then the rest of us come underneath that. And, and we're called to do what we're supposed to do. But, but the goal is, the goal of teaching, the goal of everything we do at a church is to raise up people to know Jesus, love Jesus, follow Jesus, serve Jesus, commit to the mission of Jesus, and, and do all these things that Jesus has called us to do, and that's maturity. It, it, it's funny that sometimes the people that have been Christians the longest are the most immature when it comes to faith, right? Because they think it's about them and their way, and this is what I grew up with, and this is what I want, and all that, and where it's not about them, it's not about me, it's not about you. Following Jesus is about him, and we are blessed to be on that ride. We're to speak the truth in love for the body, Paul tells us. Do your part, and don't nitpick at the other parts that maybe aren't doing it the way that you think they should do it. Then we'll finish up our, our passage today with a, a little, little trouble issue going on here in relationships. Anybody had a relationship problem in their life? All right, well, and maybe you will uh, find this something that you can attest to yourself. But sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, hey, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Here we have Paul and Barnabas. They had just done that first missionary journey together. And, and Paul's like, all right, it's time for missionary journey number two. Let's, let's get on this. Let's go, Barnabas. Uh, pack your bag. And uh, Barnabas said, hey, let's take my cousin. Let's take John Mark. And Paul's like, time out there, big Barney. We're not going to do that, right? He, he bailed on us, and so we're not taking him with us. And this wasn't necessarily a, a theological thing. This was more a principle thing. I mean, uh, Paul's thinking, we can't trust him. We can't depend on him, so uh, let's not take him. And they had such a, a sharp disagreement, and the, the word here actually used is where we get our paradox. They, they were on such different sides of this that uh, their, their relationship was fractured because of John Mark. And Barnabas wanted to take him. Paul said no. A relationship squabble in the church. You know, you think about that. Who was right and who was wrong in the Paul-Barnabas scenario? Well, it really doesn't matter. Uh, God used it and, and was glorified because they both went out and did different things in different places of the church. But you say, well, didn't you talk about uh, church split and it's not good? God can use whatever he wants to use to glorify himself. Now, there's good news. Some people will say, well, if, if uh, Paul and Barney had issues, then, then it's okay if I have issues with other church people. But we're going to come back to understand that they worked those issues out, and uh, we're going to challenge you to do the same thing. So in the midst of it, it's like, who's right and who's wrong? Well, some people say, well, uh, Barnabas really should have submitted to the apostolic authority of, of Paul. And, and, and right here, it says in our scripture, it says that Paul and Silas were commended by the church. So if the church commends them, uh, then they're the ones that are probably in the right. But you know what's funny about that? You know where, where Luke's getting his information to write this from? Paul. <laughs> Paul's giving him, oh, yeah, the church sent us out. Didn't say anything about, uh, you know. Barnabas and John Mark, but we, we don't know. It does, and that's not the issue here. The issue is that they had a falling out and they went different ways, but uh, also to understand a little bit later, they, uh, they reconnected and were friends again. Biblical unity is achievable, but we have to understand that biblical unity is hard work, right? Biblical unity means sacrifice. Sometimes we don't always get what we want. And you might know what that looks like if you've ever been married, right? No, I'm alone? Uh, or, or if you've had kids, you understand sacrifice. You understand uh, that that's just what, what it is. If, if you want to do the best that you can for your family, you, you walk that path. Uh, there's a reason Jesus told us to die to ourselves because it's not easy following him and it's not easy putting others above yourself. 
And the world wants to teach you and tell you that it's all about you. What do you want? You do that. If it feels good, do it. There are some things we should be willing to give up in order to help others know Jesus and and to show them what he looks like. Right? Paul said, Paul said, man, if I... I, if I have to not eat meat, I, I'll give up meat for the sake of, of others who struggle with me eating meat because they would associate it with idols and things like that. Paul says, I'll, I'll stop eating meat. And Paul's a bigger man than I am. You guys come up to me and say, I just have a problem spiritually with you eating meat, Jeff. And I, I say, and there's a church over here and there's a church. No, I'm just kidding. I, I would not say that. I would just say, I can't imagine not eating meat because we look in the Bible and, or, and we, we look in our language and what does meat rhyme with? eat, right? I mean, it's almost like God set that up for us, right? And and, and anyway, that's a whole other side topic. I I had a conversation with a a brother in the church here uh, just uh, about a week and a half ago about something that he he was actually wearing that could be offensive to non-believers or people who don't believe the same way he did. And as we had this conversation, I mean, he, in love, he, he received it, and uh, he took off, it was, it was a pen. <laughs> I mean, you know, he took off that, you know, like, what are you asking people to do? No, it was just a pen, all right? And, and for the sake of others. And, and that's what it means when it's hard work for biblical unity, and then we'd be willing to sacrifice for the sake of others. Uh, there's some things we've got to be willing to give up. Uh, Paul's talking to a church in Corinth, and this church is, this church is messed up. I mean, they got all kinds of stuff, idol worship going on, immorality, divided loyalties, all kinds of uh, weird stuff, false teaching going on in Corinth. And, and Paul says to them in Corinthians 1.10, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Paul's speaking to a church that is messed up. And he says, hey, be united in Christ. Be united. It's, it's hard work. I appeal. I exhort. I, I admonish you. He's saying, uh, don't, don't let the things of this world, don't let the enemy sneak in. What about unity for us? Biblical unity is hard work. Uh, we have two different styles of worship here at Riverlawn. We have a, a hymn style of worship, and then we have uh, a, a praise style of worship, which is second and third service. And, and uh, some people would say, man, we're, we're disunified as a church. We have two different churches. And, and I hope that's not the case. I hope, I hope we understand we just have different preferences, music, and, and hopefully you love uh, the, the hymn people, and the hymn people love, love the praise people and all that in, in the midst of all that because we don't want to be disunified. And so here's a question to see if you are struggling with this uh, or not. Here's here's a question I want you to answer. Can you worship God through music when it's not your preferred music choice? Can you worship God through hymns that are slower and you don't quite get and all that? If not, then there is an issue with our hearts, right? Because then it's become about what I want, what I want to do. We should be able to worship God through whatever music. If I was up here doing some reggae, you should be able to worship God, right? You're like, please don't. I won't. So we're good. I've been in foreign countries and do worship services with foreign countries, and I speak English, and they're singing it in their tongue of that country. And I'm like, how rude is that, that they're not singing in English for me? Right? You would say, Jeff, that is ridiculous. And I'd say, you're absolutely right. But sometimes that's how we think when it comes to what we want in church. Make it all about us. I can, I can sing praises to God and love God and worship in, in a country where I don't know the language. And I can in a, through a hymn and I can through a worship song. We need to make it about him and not us. I love what Archbishop uh, Bishop Marco de Domenis said a long time ago. He said, in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, and in all things love. Right? Uh, hold true to what's most important, the essentials. And, and stuff like end times views or things that aren't essential, man, just, just there's liberty, there's freedom, but in all things love. I'll tell you this, our make a disciple moment is a disciple strives for biblical unity. A disciple strives for biblical unity. So what do we do? Here's two things. Here's how we can know how to achieve biblical unity. First of all, know him more. Know Jesus more. Live for Jesus more. Right? The more you know Jesus, the more you'll be unified on what he's unified on. John chapter 10, verse 27 and 28, Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hands. Right? Are you listening to him? Listen to him more than you listen to me. Listen to him more than you listen to any other uh, preacher you like or any other theologian or what you're reading. Man, listen to Jesus. Know him. Know what he wants us to be unified on. Jesus knew how to live his life and to make essential what was essential and non-essential what was non-essential because he knew the will of the Father. 
You want to know what to be unified on? Know the will of the Father. Know him more. And then work relationships out. Peter and James talked about that, right, at the Jerusalem Council. And and here we have uh, Paul and Barnabas going through that. They have a disagreement which led to the split. And and yet in the midst of it, we say, see, see, that happened. But then we go back and uh, we have a but God because he uh, restores these relationships. In 1 Corinthians 9, 6, Paul says, or is it only I and Barnabas who lack the right to not work for a living? Right? We see uh, later on Paul saying, hey, think of Barnabas. Think of me. And then he didn't want John Mark to go with him, right, in Acts 15. But here in, in 2 Timothy 4.11, he says, Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. That's great. There's reconciliation. There's restoration in relationship. Folks, we need that. We need to work relationships out. Romans 12, 18 says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. As far as it depends on you. You may not be able to live at peace with everyone, but as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone, right? Christians need to uh, not be the reason there is not peace in our relationship. Some of us don't have peace in our relationships because we haven't forgiven people that we need to forgive people. You're like, Jeff, you have no idea what they've done to me. You have no idea how they've hurt me. They've abused me. They've neglected me. They've abandoned me. They've done this. They've said this. You're right. I don't. God does, and he still tells you to forgive. Matter of fact, Jesus says some harsh words. And in Matthew, he says, if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you your sins. But if you don't, he won't. Oh, some of us need to go home today and need to get on the phone with a a kid or a parent or a sibling or, or a coworker or a classmate or maybe even the person you share your bed with. That is your husband or your wife. Right? And, and we need to go and we need to make things right and say we're sorry for things we've done and, and live at peace. That doesn't mean you've got to be buddy-buddy. It doesn't mean the people that have hurt you, you've got to hang out with. Them. That's not what it means. It means that you don't hold on to unforgiveness and let that tear you up from the inside out. You don't hold on to bitterness because that's what the enemy wants you to do. But Jesus says, forgive as I have forgiven. Some of us need to work on those relationships today, and I encourage you to do that. And we be like Paul and Barnabas. Yeah, we'll have our tiffs but we don't let that stop us being unified in Christ and we make things right. Would we do that today, church? Would you stand with me as we pray? Father, you are good and you've given us these clear instructions throughout your word to be faithful to you and what matters to you. I pray we would know you well. We would, uh, we would love you well. We would serve you well. We would forgive others well as you have forgiven us father help us to be unified with the things that matter and lord on the things that don't matter man we have liberty there's freedom in that father help us do all things in love so you would be glorified we love you father and we pray this in jesus name